Hi, this is Pat Iyer with Writing to Get Business, and today we're going to be speaking with Lisa Ryan, who is the author of 10 books. Lisa, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me, Pat. Tell uh, the people who are listening a little bit about your background, what do you do to make a living, and then we'll focus on your first book and how you got that one started. Sure. Uh, my corporate background before I started speaking 10 years ago was actually in sales. I went from being an executive recruiter, um, one of the few people on the planet who can actually say they sold their mother. Now, <laughs> mom hated that job, but I told her, mother, you have got to stay there at least 90 days because I have a guarantee and I can't afford to give back the commission I made on you. Uh, from there, I went into industrial sales where I sold exciting products like electrical cord and cable as well as welding products, and uh, yes, I do weld, and from there I went into healthcare. Um, Then on October 12, 2010, when my lucrative medical sales position was eliminated via group conference call, with 12 of us getting canned at the same time, Mm -hmm. um, that was the day that Gratigy was born. So uh, I will be having my 10-year anniversary this October, as far as being on my own, 100% supporting myself as a speaker and author. And you mentioned gratitude. Did I hear that correctly? Yes. The name of my company is Gratigy, which is the mushing together of gratitude and strategies. So no matter what group I'm talking to or no matter what program I'm doing, there's always the foundation of how gratitude and appreciation helps you to create the corporate culture that keeps your top talent from becoming someone else's. I bet you said that once or twice. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I have. Interesting. So, Are you then focused on helping companies with retention? Is that the bucket that that would go into? It really does. I work a lot with uh, manufacturing associations, really capitalizing on my welding um, and industrial sales background. And plus, they're just the groups that I really enjoy speaking to. Um, But it's, it's one of those that, all audiences can benefit from. I mean, I speak a lot to long-term care. I speak a lot to financial services. But when it comes to actually marketing my speaking, um, it is to the, if the collar is blue, they're my people. <laughs> so. mm. And that encompasses a large segment of our working people. Yeah, it really does. So that falls into not only manufacturing, that falls into construction and agriculture and a um, lot of different uh, things along those home building, you name it. It's certainly a quality that's important for managers and workers in all fields. If I think about my perspective of of blue collar workers, I think maybe those are the people who are laboring without recognition or doing hard work and perhaps working with a kind of a rough and tumble boss who doesn't always take time to say thank you. Am I correct in that or is is that a stereotype? No, you're, you're very correct. And what my programs do is it actually gives them not only permission to find their employees doing the good, but it also um, shows them the numbers behind it because that, you know, gratitude, appreciation are not soft skills. They are essential skills. And when I give these leaders and owners and stuff basically permission to um, to connect with their employees on that human connection level, then they see these employees are not going to call in sick as often. They're going to work harder when they're there. They're going to have fewer safety accidents. So all of these things add up to, to protect their bottom line. But too often times they're thinking that it's a, a soft skill or why do I have to thank my guys? That's what the paycheck's for. Mm-hmm. And at the end of my programs, they realize that that's not the case and that this stuff really does work. Well, take us back to where you were in your business when you decided to write your first book. And when we had our call in preparation for this podcast, you were amazing when you told me you wrote five books with five different models. So I'm fascinated by that. Can you tell us about that first book 
What was going through your mind when you decided that you wanted to write it? I wanted to be an author. I just wanted to have my name on something. And I was uh, given the opportunity to be uh, to write a chapter in an anthology. So if you're not familiar with the anthology, think of Chicken Soup for the Soul, where, every, where you have lots and lots of people writing chapters. So as a, being in an anthology, I was co-authoring with like Dr. John Martini from The Secret. Um, so having that book with excellence actually made me an author. Um, so from there though, that wasn't quite enough. And I did my first ebook on a website called Smashwords. Mm -hmm. And it was called uh, Thank You Notes, Your 30 Days to Gratitude Workbook. And the funny thing with that, I uploaded uh, thank you notes to Smashwords in 2012. And three or four times a year, Smashwords will send me an email that said that, you know, they put a dollar into my account or they put 18 cents into my account. So, you know, <laughs> it's still out there making money. Mm -hmm. uh, my first, I should say, real book that I did on my own was The Upside of Downtimes, Discovering the Power of Gratitude. And that was a book that I did through Outskirts Press. Um, Outskirts is what you'd call a hybrid or vanity publisher in that I bought one of their packages. They designed uh, or I paid them to do the cover, uh, to do the interior formatting. The marketing was still up to me, but I have just a terrific book. And it's one of my, it's one of my very favorite books because I had been thinking about this book and researching this book for a couple years and then when the book decided it was time to show up, it just flowed. I mean, I sat down. Now, these were 10-hour days for several weeks of just writing and writing and writing. But it was almost like the book came through me. Mm -hmm. And that was published in March of uh, 2012. And so that was mm -hmm. my, and, and like I said, it's still uh, that, that heart, that, that, book is still the nearest and dearest to my heart because I just, um, I love everything about it. I love the message. I love the words. I love the cover. <laughs> so. And it's also one of those evergreen topics that you can apply to downsides in your life can be, downtimes can be, you know, when you're struggling with a, a divorce or an illness or a loss of a job or a troubled child or any number of things that test our courage and our character. Right. And this book really focused on, in my programs when I'm doing them live, I have my show talk and my thanks talk. So the upside of down times is based on my show talk, which takes a look at gratitude, first of all, from the aspect of the self. How does it change our perspective? It has the health benefits because as you know, with being a nurse, there are lots and lots of, of research that shows the benefits of positive emotions on our health. Um, there's the, the O is relationship with others. So how does that uh, really positively impact all of our relationships? And then the W is wealth. How do we take that into the workplace? And that really is the, the correct order because if employee engagement is only about the workplace and we're not getting that ourselves, you know, it's just that I need these people to work harder. No, not going to happen. You get it yourself. You start to feel better, the health benefits, your relationship with others get better. And then you can take that better, stronger person into the workplace. And that's when the magic happens. Mm-hmm. I'm intrigued by your process of using this book, describing how this book flowed out of you, because that's something that people struggle with. And I'm sure for the person who's listening to this podcast, that will resonate. There are times, and I've written or edited at this point, 49 books. Oh, wow. And I can remember times when I had that same sensation that you did of just like there was material in me that needed to get onto the keyboard and it just came flooding out. 
And then there are other times when I've sat down to write when I've said, why is this so hard? Why am I, I feel like I'm chipping away at a stone. Is there anything that you can remember from that flowing process that would help the person listening to this as to what might have triggered that or what were the conditions by which you felt that occurred? Well, number one, with that book, it was a hard deadline. Um, I was actually, I had filmed a movie called The uh, the Keeper of the Keys. I was one of the experts on that where I talked about gratitude. And um, I was doing a red carpet premiere of my of the movie in Cleveland. And I wanted to have a book um, for that premiere. So the hard deadline, I think there's something in your mind when you have a hard deadline that that kind of forces that to come. But keep in mind that this book had been, um, I'd been doing research and it was at the back of my mind for a long time. But I try, you know, I try to come up with like artificial deadlines and stuff. Oh, I'm going to get this book done by this date. Um, That will work to a point depending on your personality. But when you have a hard deadline, something that you have a reason that that book is coming out. And sometimes it's you're forcing yourself that, you know, I I am going to go on a book tour and you make appointments with local bookstores or whatever for June 15th. That would be a little close this year for September 15th. You know in your head, okay, I, that means I have to get this book written so that it gets to the editor, so that it does this, and, and just giving yourself some kind of solid concrete goal to get that book out with that firm deadline where you have no choice in the matter, that really helps to bring that to the surface. You're right. Uh, I hear so many stories of people who don't have hard deadlines and they procrastinate or they got caught up in the perfectionism trap, it's not quite ready to release. It needs a little more tweaking. It needs another chapter. I should add some more stories. And then it sits there and twirls in their mind and never gets out of their mind and into the hands of somebody else. Exactly. You just have to go with the done is better than perfect. (laughs) Which is a hard expression to incorporate. It's easy to say, isn't it? Boy, For us perfectionists who say, oh, but just a little bit more work and it'll be ready. Right, exactly. exactly. Um, I can think of a woman who sent me a memoir to edit on a pen drive. And before I could even open the package, she saw, sent me an email and said, Pat, I thought about more stories to add. Don't start yet. And now she sent me a second pen drive with stories, which I'm editing. And she has since emailed me and said, I thought about even more stories, but I think I'm going to wait until you're done. So I think with her, my point is it's always so tempting to think you can just do a little bit more tweaking and keep refining and perfecting your product. And the end result for some is that the book never gets released because it's not quite good enough. It sounds like you have not fallen into that trap with the large number of books that you've put together. Well, and I also um, encouraged, I had one of my friends who had written a book and she wanted to, her whole thing was she was going to have the new revised edition of the book come out. And I said, Diane, why don't you just write another book? Because she had had a podcast and she was talking about doing a podcast based on the expert interviews that she had. I said, anybody can have one book. Okay. But when it comes to, why don't you just have book number two and and not worry about updating that first book? And the light bulb went on in her head. And (laughs) now that book came out and now she just released her third book. So after you get out of the need to have this perfect book, oh, I'm going to keep re-editing my first book and have the second edition and the third edition, you don't need that. You know, the upside of downtimes, there's some chapters that I think about going back and, and taking out because they are completely irrelevant. I was talking about a, uh, an associate in a um, networking group that I had started called the Positive Thinkers Network. That group disbanded in 2013. I should go in and take that out, 
but you know what? It's part of the story, and I'd rather come out with new books and hold out those new baby book in my hands versus being concerned about something because it's not, you know, one chapter is not relevant anymore. Mm -hmm. That was your third book. What was the model that you used for your fourth book? Um, the fourth book, I was having coffee with one of my friends at Panera, and she was telling me that the hottest books on Kindle were 30 to 50 pages. And I said, huh, I could write a 30 to 50 page book. I wonder what I'd write it on. And then I said, I know, what about overcoming public speaking anxiety? So that's when from afraid to speak to paid to speak, how overcoming public speaking anxiety boosts your confidence and career came out. And that was March 4th. 2013 that that came out and I specifically chose the date so people could march forth to mm -hmm. them speaking and um, the the book went it was a bestseller and one of the reasons why and this was really interesting because about a couple weeks after it came out I got an email from Amazon with the subject line of from afraid to speak to paid to speak and I'm like oh, Amazon is ripping off my title what's up with that and I opened the email, and because it had such a rockin' title, Amazon was saying, based on your preferences, we thought that you would enjoy these other books. My book, speaker book, speaker book, speaker book, speaker book. So for probably six months after I wrote that book, mm -hmm. Amazon continued to promote it. Nice. So that was the fourth book. And then the fifth book came as a result of that, that I had a client that wanted to um, that, that wanted me, uh, they wanted me to do a program based on from afraid to speak to paid to speak. And I said, well, the book's a Kindle. And she's like, but we really want a copy of your book. I said, but the book's really a Kindle. And the third time she was trying to tell me that she wanted to give me money for a book, <laughs> I said, huh, I should figure this out. So I turned from afraid to speak to paid to speak as a Kindle book. I turned it into a book that I used on create space, which has now has since become Kindle direct publishing or KDP.amazon. So with create space, I took that same book, but I, I made it more into a workbook where it had questions and chapters and challenges and those type of things throughout the book. So then I had that, um, that, that book and I was so impressed with create space that the um, next four of my printed books I used, and like I said, they've now become KDP.Amazon. I had one other Kindle book called uh, The Verbal Hug, which was a, a quote book, um, to, you know, quotes and pictures, basically. I also had a gratitude journal, which was a book of lines with some quotes in it. Um, mm -hmm. And then my last two books, Manufacturing the Engagement and To Have and to Hold, and I think that this is going to be a tip that will really help your listeners, because these two books came from a list that I had put together. The list was 101 Awesome Ways to Elevate Employee Engagement. So I said, well, you know, that's a really good start to a book. So what I took is I took those 101 tips and I wrote 250 to 300 words on each. So basically it was one page. And so those 101 tips became um, a tip book. So it was super easy mm. to, to write. And, and um, manufacturing engagement came out first. And actually there was only 98 tips because I discovered in my 101 list that three of them were like total duplicates. So <laughs> and I figured, well, nobody does 98 strategies. So that was 98 strategies to attract and retain your industry's top talent. But that book was really geared to manufacturing and factories and blue collar. And I needed more of a general HR book. So that's when To Have and To Hold came out, which actually was 101 tips because I, I totally played on the wedding theme. And the 101, I used the engagement ring as the zero. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, and I came up with three new tips. But that book was more geared towards HR and to um, you know general office so it's probably 80 percent the same content where manufacturing engagement the chapters are put together in my thanks process 
uh, for building trust, helping your employees and acknowledging their efforts, navigating work-life balance, getting to know your people and serving a greater mission. The to have and to hold is literally the wedding vows from this day forward in sickness and health for better or worse. And then my favorite chapter, and it was, I totally had fun with this book because it was all wedding puns. But my favorite chapter was um, till death do us part question mark. And the whole chapter was bought, was basically probably not, but if you use the tips in this book, you'll keep the honeymoon going. Mm. <laughs> The thing that I love about that book is I totally had fun with it. I took the whole thing with a grain of salt. I used bad puns and the book sells a ton, which I really like too. Yes, absolutely. What's fascinating, Lisa, is from the perspective of creating the content, you got that repurposing down to a science from mm -hmm. using those 101 tips fleshing them out to chapters that are like the equivalent of a length of a blog post. If you think about a 300 yeah. word blog post as being a minimum, and then you took those tips, shifted the audience a little bit and came up with a little bit of new content and repurposed that content with different examples. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And actually two of my books, um, 52 weeks of gratitude and 52 more weeks of gratitude were literally the first two years of gratitude thought of the week. Mm. So I, mm -hmm. I literally took my blog and made those into short books too. So, you know, you have the content. If you've been blogging, if you've been doing any type of online coursing or teaching or training, uh, you have the content. It's just figuring out how to get that content out of you to put it into a readable form that people will like and buy. And another thing I love about your model is the framework that you took this content and it would be tempting to say, oh, 98 tips or 101 tips and just, li just list them sequentially. Uh, a woman hired me earlier this year to edit her book and she had 100 tips geared to a person who's dying about saying goodbye, leaving memories, and they were all one right after another, but they weren't put into buckets. As I was reading it, I was saying, well, here, these ones relate to what do you do with your possessions? And these relate to leaving letters for your family. And these relate to the creative things that you can do with your ashes, uh, some things that I had never heard of, like you can make jewelry and you can shoot your ashes up into outer space if you want. And there's all kinds of opportunities to do things with your ashes, but taking that content, being able to step away from it like you did and say, here's a framework. People who are reading the material like to have things that are grouped together that make sense. Like mm -hmm. you took the word thanks and grouped your content together into discrete subject areas so that it would flow for the reader. Right. And was it a perfect just match? them all out. Right, exactly. And was it an absolute perfect match in every chapter? No. And that's the thing. Don't get so caught up in perfection that it had to be, did this really do trust? You know what? For this one, trust was the best chapter for it to go into. So mm -hmm. we, kind of, we kind of massage things to make them work. But I, I agree with you. And when you're doing a tips book, um, just like you saw, the, the chapters kind of speak to you and they, they put themselves in these little buckets if you're just paying attention. Yes, yes. And you have the ability to see it and you've got an open mind about it and, and not a, a fixed concept of, oh, it's got to flow this way. If you're open to the possibilities of sorting it, which is something I love to do. I, I could sit there all day and put content into buckets because it's, and maybe there's a little obsessive compulsive gene to me, <laughs> just between you and me. <laughs> and all your listeners. <laughs> yes, yes. Just between us. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, do you have more books in you, Lisa? I'm actually thinking about what my next book is going to be. The last several that I've done have been just kind of like blog posts 
um, and tips books. And I was thinking about what the next, uh, I don't want to call it a real book because they're all real, but I really want to focus on um, a book that talks about um, culture and employee retention and just have a, a beefier model than just a, a tips book. Um, it will probably still be in that when I write books, I, I write books the way that I like to read them, which is short and manageable. So I like keeping my books in the 120 to 150 page um, realm. That way they're not, uh, you know, they're, they're manageable for me and they're manageable for the readers. And then they have a much higher likelihood of actually getting written versus something that's, you know, 300 pages long with, you know, nine point font in it. It's like, mm -hmm. you look at it and go, mm -hmm. oh, I can't even think about dealing with that right now. Not that there's not really good books like that out there. I just don't read them. <laughs> so. I understand. And the trend is overall that books are shrinking just for the reason that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. People want that short, manageable pieces of content that they can get through quickly and not feel like they're entering an ordeal the minute they pick that book up. Yeah, it's a sense of accomplishment. It, it feels good when I can, and I happen to be a fast reader. So I can sit down and I can plow through a book in a, a day, you know, sometimes a couple hours, depending on it. Where my husband, it'll take him six months to read a book because he just, you know, he, he just really, he's a slow reader and he processes differently mm -hmm. than I do. So, you know, for every type of author, for every type of reader, you know, there's a style and there's, there's something, um, you know, that, that we can make it work for us. So don't think about, you know, what's the hottest thing on the market or, you know, where can I make the most money or what should my book be about? It's something that resonates with you and, and thinking about, you know, what do, what's your message to the world and then figuring it out to put it in a way that will make other people want to read it? How will it value? How will it add value to the lives of your readers? I was teaching a class last night to some people on how to write a book. And one of the criteria was, when you think about your topic is what's going to make you happy? Because you're living with that subject matter as you have defined your subjects are are all pretty much in the same bucket with different nuances. Employee engagement, retention, gratitude. It's something that you're passionate about and you've been living with for a long time. And then become known as the author of a book on that topic leads to speaking, consulting, blogging, potentially a podcast. All of that content fits together very nicely as opposed to if you wrote a book about this topic and then you're over here the next time and then you're down here somewhere else, it's less coherent and you're less able to build on it from a business perspective. Yep. Which is the other thing that I like about dictating my books. You know, it, it, I used to use Dragon nat Naturally Speaking and now on my PC there's a dictate button. So mm. if I'm doing blog posts or whatever, I can put on my headset and dictate that blog post. And then I go back and edit it. But, uh, you know, I want it to be my voice. I want it to be my conversation, the way that I talk. So when, that, when people are reading the book, it's like I'm speaking to them. It doesn't sound like some, you know, PhD Harvard professor that's talking eight levels above the people who are reading it. What do you use to transcribe that file? Well, when I'm use when I am, uh, when I hit the the dictate thing, I just I just speak and it goes into a Word document. Oh, okay. I was thinking you were using the voice recorder on the PC. No, no. Uh, on uh, in Word, there is a a button that says dictate. So I I click on the dictate button. Like I said, I wear my headset and then I just talk. Wow. Well, thank you for that tip. I don't think I've ever paid attention to that. Dictate I don't know button. if Apple has it, but I know as a PC, I yeah. have a word. I have my dictate button. It's on the upper right-hand side of the uh, toolbar. What a revelation. Yep. It makes life really easy. It certainly <laughs> and then does. I, and then I like Grammarly. 
Um, I still use an editor, of course, we all need editors, but what Grammarly does is it, um, I don't have to, I know that at least the, the grammar part of it is taken care of, and I do have the paid version of Grammarly that I really like. I'll put my blog posts through that just to see if there's better words that I could use, or, you know, my thing that I find out is a lot is that um, Grammarly gets me all the time on tense because I, I talk a lot. They want you to talk in active tense, and a lot of times I'm talking in passive voice, and Grammarly doesn't like that. And then when I go back and figuring it out, how to make it active voice, it does sound a lot better. Mm -hmm. And then I can take, you know, that, um, that Grammarly edited work that's um, from there and then give it to the content editor who will look for flow and uh, everything else that goes along with that. Well, thank you. Those are great suggestions. How can our listeners find out more about you and the services that you offer? Sure. My website is lisaryanspeaks.com. Um, you can also send me an email to lisa at gratigy, which is again, G-R-A-T-E-G-Y.com. And I'm all over social media. So if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn or Facebook, um, I, I'm there as well. And Lisa's last name is spelled R-Y-A-N, Ryan. Yep. LisaRyanSpeaks.com. So Lisa, the takeaway points that I have come from this conversation with is the importance of picking a subject and developing it well. What you've shared with us is the idea of taking a content area and then expressing it in different vehicles from a chapter in a book to a Smashwords book, to an ebook, to Kindles, to physical books, to workbooks, to tip books. You have really explored different areas in the way that you've shared your knowledge with your readers. Right. And Picking, you can yeah, you repurpose everything. Exactly. Exactly. And for people who've been blogging, you've got tons of content that you're accumulating. I started blogging you remember when Michael Jackson died? Yes. I can tie my first blog post back to his death because there was a question about what caused him to die. Was Initially, it was thought to be a Demerol overdose and turned out to be something different. And I wrote my first blog post about him, and shortly thereafter, when the plane came down in the Hudson River, okay. and we had that mythical water landing that you and I heard about on planes for years. In the event of a water landing, yes. seat cushion is a flotation device. Remember, I thought, yes. yeah, right, you know, a water landing. Isn't that a nice way of saying crashing the airplane into the water? That was my second blog post. So I can tie my blogging back to those events and all the content that I've created and all the content that you've created out of blogs can be repurposed, pulled together. We've stressed the importance of organizing your content if you've got short chapters of making sure that it's in some type of framework that makes sense to the listeners. And take advantage of the tools. Both um, Grammarly has a free and a paid version of their tool. You're not such a great writer that you can't benefit from having a little bit of machines learning, looking over your shoulder to point out things that you might be blind to because we do get caught up in passive voice and habitual ways of phrasing things without realizing that we can make it flow and sound much more active in our voice. And of course, the biggest tip of all, that dictate button, which I'm now, as soon as we <laughs> hang up, I'm going to be looking at, huh, where is that and what does it do? <laughs> so thank you for that. You are very welcome. <laughs> and thank you to you who's been listening to this podcast or watching it on our YouTube channel. We appreciate you spending the last hour, half hour or so listening to Lisa Ryan's tips on writing, and I hope it has inspired you to look at your writing in a different way. Thank you, Lisa. You're very welcome. Hi, this is Pat Iyer with Writing to Get Business, and I have with me today Tracy Cromwell, who is the author of the forthcoming book, Your Personal Journey with Food, a guide for the confused and frustrated dieter. 
Tracy and I have just finished a podcast, and I'd like her to share the answer to this question. Tracy, what is our listener going to get from listening to your podcast? Thank you, Pat. It's been been a pleasure being on with you, and I'm I'm so grateful to have you ask me to be on your podcast. So, um, the listener, um, basically, we talked about um, how I even um, came up with the idea to write my book, and um, you know, uh, so we'll be learning about that and how writing a book can come from many different, I think, many different angles, right? And um, and a lot of the reason that I, I wrote the book um, was then to help people that are confused and frustrated like I was um, in terms of how to, how to eat, um, how to live healthy, um, and, and learning that, you know what, um, it's different for everyone. So um, uh, the biggest takeaway, one of the biggest takeaways is that um, a lot of people are confused, but, but you can change that. And um, so I, th- I think through this podcast, you're going to go ahead and learn some of the ways that you can do that. And one thing we didn't really highlight on the show, Tracy, is that you had an opportunity to collaborate with somebody who was 3,000 miles away in an entirely different country and got this book written together, yes. which is a, a big accomplishment. Yes, having a co-author um, brings in incredible dynamics. And uh, we thought it was wonderful because she's in Santiago, Chile, and I live up in Washington State in the USA. But we realized we had the same issues with health. She and I had similar paths. Our countries have similar challenges with processed food, access to good food, and um, bringing her her personality and and what she was experiencing in South America, bringing that to the book, and then bringing me from America, it's a really neat dynamic. You know, um, we're two totally different people. Our messages are similar, but you know, she. Um, I just love her perspective. And so you'll feel her personality as well. Perfect. But it's, yeah, and it's possible. You can write from anywhere. <laughs> and that's a huge takeaway lesson. Having another person who is a co-author can make the project much easier. You mm-hmm. two combined your knowledge, both of you from the same educational program, and with two different perspectives, cultural perspectives and life expectancy experiences but got together to pull your knowledge to create your book yes 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 yeah be sure to return to writing to get business to hear tracy cromwell talk about her book your personal journey with food a guide for the confused and frustrated dieter thank you thank you